動でお風呂を沸かします。Hello and welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast coming to you from four undisclosed locations in the UK. My name is Dan Schreiber. I am sitting here with Anna Tashinsky, Andrew Hunter Murray, and James Harkin. And once again, we have gathered around the microphones with our four favorite facts from the last seven days. And in no particular order, here we go. Starting with you, Anna. My fact this week is that the world's first electricity power station was built to power an artificial rainbow. Wow. Very cool. That is cool. It's the 1870s, late 1870s, 1877, 78, and we're in Bavaria. And <laughs> Ooh, it was nice. built for this king, King Ludwig II, known as the fairy tale king, for reasons that will become obvious during this section. And he, yeah, used he, a, he used to be a frog, didn't he? <laughs> he did, yeah. <laughs> Um, and he wanted to make himself this grotto. He wanted to recreate these things called blue grottos, which are natural sea caves where the sunlight makes the water glow in all rainbow colours. And so he decided, I've heard about this new invention, electricity, and I think I'm going to use it. And so there was a little power station set up, which used a steam, pa- steam basically, which powered a dynamo. Um, and that generated electricity. So spun some coils around magnets, generated electricity. You got a full on rainbow inside his personal cave. It is cool, but you would think that they'd find something better to do with their electricity, wouldn't they? Mm. Like, I can't think of anybody uh, else. Well. But it's amazing what he did install because that grotto is full of not only the first artificial rainbow to be powered by this station, but also mm. the first. Um, like I've been to those pools where they create artificial waves, and you see people yeah. going surfing on them indoors. The, the prototype, basically, of that was a built wave for this pool. grotto. Really? Oh, the wave pool, yeah, it was a wave pool, Amazing. the world's first known wave machine. That's so. I spent cool. so long trying to work out how that was powered, mm. and I can't work out if it's just directly steam powered or that whether that was part of the electricity power station fueling it. Wait, but- are you talking about the the Undosa wave pool? Because this was a little bit after he died. D- Dan, are you saying it was one inside the cave? At yeah, I'm saying it was yeah. one in the grotto, yeah. Because, okay, this is bizarre. So he died at uh, Lake Stramberg, which is another thing we'll come on to, Ludwig. Uh, he died there. And then 20 years after he died, this is what I found, is that the first wave machine, the Vellenbad, or wave bath, was built on the shores of Lake Stramberg. And it was it was given the name Undosa as well, which is Latin for the wave kingdom. And it was steam-powered. The steam engines lifted up these massive pontoons and that pulled up water and then you crashed back down and wow. that created a big up wave. Oh my yeah. god, that sounds so and, cool. And that was in the, what, the early, the like late century. 19, late 19th, early 20th century. And the next oldest one opened in 1912 and that is called the Biltspad and it's still working today. It's a 109 <laughs> really? year old wave machine. That's amazing. Because actually yeah. the one that I used to go to in Bolton uh, in the 90s isn't there anymore. And so that shows, <laughs> wow. doesn't it? It shows how, how well this one's Sick stayed. transit, yeah. They used to build things to last in the olden days. They did, yeah. Um, but did that mean on the pontoon, that's sort of a double ride, right? Because if you're in the water, you can surf the waves. And then if you're sitting on the pontoon, you're seesawing up and down so. that pontoon, aren't that's you? That's great. Yeah. They don't do that enough for rides where you're sort of half on the ride before you get onto the actual ride itself. That no. feels like a missed trick. You've it invented really that there now. I, I like think it. it's a bit like when you're queuing for a ride and they have stuff to keep the queue occupied, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, but they usually send like a drunken, dressed up person <laughs> who just harasses you and makes you do stuff you don't want to do. do. Damn, in my experience. What, what theme parks have you been to? I was at, it was at the Sydney Museum when I was a kid and this drunken Cleopatra came up and she started <laughs> Cleopatra. harassing me. Yeah. <laughs> that. It feels like we've stumbled more into a kind of therapy thing now than a... <laughs> that's not a... You know, that that's your least relatable bit of stand-up I've ever heard, Dad. You know when you came through a museum and Cleopatra's drunk and she's harassing you? Did she show you her asp? <laughs> <laughs> Just on the waves that Ludwig made, I did read that they were mostly ripples. So yeah. I, there's a lot of claims, but I don't, I'm not sure you could surf them. I think you made a good bodyboard <laughs> as a small toddler on his ripples if you really tried. Uh, but he was into lots of stuff, if not surfing, wasn't he? Uh, and actually, I think the speaking of rides, the um, castle at Disneyland uh, is based on Neuschweinstein Castle, which is one of his. Isn't yes, it? I think. 
Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. It it's, ama- it's amazingly similar. The Disney. Well, really, you realize how much Disney just nicked from Prince Ludwig. <laughs> it's so unfair. <laughs> um, and that was this. It's the same one that's used in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang in Vulgaria. Yeah, yes. Feinstein. Yeah, yeah, they filmed there. Yeah. Wow. And Someone said that it's quite tacky if close up. It's best from a distance. I've been there. there I must up. say. And Have you? Yeah, I think probably from the car park, which is the other side of a valley. It's an amazing photograph. Um, definitely. That's my tip. If you're ever in Neuschweinstein, just go to the car park and take your photos from there and then go to a nice cafe over the road. So, James, did you get to see, there's a few things in there that I found fascinating and he built them in a couple of these places. But one of the things was he didn't want to see his servants when he was eating. And so there is this this do- this table that he built where the table, when it was going to be laid, would be lowered through the ground to where the servants were and where the kitchens were uh-huh. and everything would be put on and then it would come back up. So if he sort of like, I guess, needed salt, he would send the table back down and, just, and then it would come back however many minutes later but he didn't want to see anyone did, did you see that that's, by any chance? that's I actually Linderhof ca- Dan oh uh, that's Linderhof that well, one's I, Linderhof I heard it was in both actually I heard that he built he built one there as well but maybe I mean, maybe I'm misreading that the guy was wealthy he could commission a table uh, and a <laughs> but so there was definitely that at Linderhof and he that Linderhof was also where he had the peacock throne which was a massive peacock uh, also, there was a massive peacock statue, which he had placed on the lawn to clarify that he was in. So please don't bother him. That was his way of announcing that oh. he didn't want any attention was a big statue of a peacock. <laughs> it feels like a mixed signal to me. I don't know. Maybe it would take people's attention away from him. That's a very good point. Yeah, that's very, you can only look at one at a time. He was very antisocial. Um, kind of a weird loner with a peacock obsession, I think, because he also had a giant peacock made of emeralds hanging from one of his ceilings. But his castle, uh, at Lind- I think this was Lindhoff Castle, is big and had one bedroom. Wow. Really? really? You, wow. you are not having Often. guests. When you're browsing wow. property websites and you see, you know, a lovely looking house and then you see one bed, you think... Mm, <laughs> yeah, but imagine if you went on to... I don't know what they call right move or something. And you put your filters in and you're just like, I just want a one bedroom house. <laughs> and then you sort by price and then you get this thing, which is worth about 10 billion pounds. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, you've got to uncheck wave pools. <laughs> 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 he had a um, favorite column at Lindhoff. Lindhoff. Oh, Did he? Don't we all? Yeah, it was just his personal favorite column. So every time he passed it, he couldn't help but stop to kiss it. He, oh. just, he just loved it. Um, and he also had a bust of Marie Antoinette. And every time he walked past it, he would stroke her cheek and bow to her. So he he did have a few Mm. people in the house. They just weren't real. Well, he also would sometimes kind of sit around talking to uh, Louis the Sixteenth, who died quite a long time before, Um, because, like you say, he. I mean, it's quite a sad existence in a way, isn't it? Because you know he was painfully shy, and you know, possibly some mental problems there as well, and you know. Mm. It was really, it's it's yeah. kind of a sad story, but with lots of beautiful things to see about it with all these yeah. amazing things that he built. James, it's kind of like your car park thing. If you look at it from the right distance, it's incredibly magical yeah. and beautiful. And up close, actually, the reality is a little bit stranger and sadder. Yeah. Um, he was, I think it was Louis the Fourteenth. he was obsessed with. Um, but he was, he was really into him. Well, he wasn't definitely it? was seen talking to Louis the Sixteenth for sure. Oh, maybe it's all yeah. the. Is that just in the air, James? Like if he was at his he empty dinner table? At, yeah, he would be sat at his dinner table having a conversation with dead kings, basically. Wow. But I, I can't say it wasn't Louis the Fourteenth. It could have been as well, for sure. Only because he was so he used to make his whole retinue dress up as Louis the Fourteenth's um, sort of servants. Right. He would imitate Louis the Fourteenth in absolutely everything. He'd always dress up as him. He basically wanted. I think he was in love. This is my theory. He was very passionately in love with Louis the Fourteenth and Wagner. Mm. Um, these were his two idols. I mm. think it's fairly certain he was gay. And yeah. so he imitated Louis and with Wagner, which this grotto was based on Wagner's Tannhäuser opera, uh, which is like all about the lure of Venus's grotto and how sexy it was. He used to write these letters to Wagner, which are the raunchy stuff mm. Um, mm. and put Wagner in quite a weird position, I think. I mean, the story of Wagner and Ludwig is extraordinary. You know, yeah. Ludwig was basically um, obsessed with Wagner and as soon as he became king, almost within weeks, he sent out his people to find him. And they had to hunt really far and wide for Wagner because at that point he was hiding from debt creditors. 
So he was in hiding and they managed to out him and go, the king wants you. And he thought, oh my God, I'm in trouble. And they said, no, they, he basically wants to um, pay off your debts and he wants you to live in this castle with him and he wants you to be his best friend. And Wagner was like, thank God, yes, <laughs> great. Yeah, he would, um, Wagner would play his um, pieces in front of Ludwig, just him, right? Yeah. It would be these massive, kind of amazing Wagnerian, obviously Wagnerian because it was Wagner who wrote them, <laughs> but these amazing operas, and but only literally just Ludwig sat on the front row, a bit like your Edinburgh show's dad, I reckon, probably. <laughs> <laughs> there was a bigger audience at the start, but when Dan got onto his, you know when you go to a theme park. <laughs> material. The ghost of all the King Louis loved that shit. So <laughs> oh dear. Um so Ludwig um Ludwig was engaged to a woman um for a small amount of time. This was his cousin Sophie Charlotte. Uh, and but basically, what happened was they got engaged, and Ludwig just kept cancelling the wedding, kept cancelling it, kept cancelling it, and eventually it all got pulled. Um, but Sophie Charlotte's really interesting. This is a sad story, but kind of interesting. So she died uh, in 1897 in a fire. She was at a charity event, uh, and there was a big fire. But she insisted that all of the um, visitors and all of the girls who were performing at this thing and all of the nuns they were all taken out first, and she refused to leave until everyone else was safe. Wow. And she ended up dying in the fire. Uh, but actually, the interesting part about it is she was her body was found because she had gold filling and she's possibly the first person who was ever identified by dental remains. Wow. In history, yeah. What a claim to fame. Yeah. Nice. Sad one, yeah. but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was reading about the way he broke off the engagement mm. and he, he, he wrote to her and he said in his letter, breaking it off, the main substance of our relationship has always been Richard Wagner's remarkable and deeply moving <laughs> destiny. <laughs> that point, you do think. Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> He's just not that into you. <laughs> um, he was deposed as from being king, right? Because they thought he was mad without any assessment. Well, there was an assessment by a few psychiatrists, but because he was living in a big castle, they couldn't really get anywhere near him so they kind of <laughs> assessed him from the car park if you could think yeah, of it that okay, way yeah. um, well, they're just waiting for the peacock to go so every day the peacock's still there nothing we can do uh, but then they sent a uh, delegation um, from Munich to Neuschweinstein where he was living to declare him insane um, but Ludwig got the local fire department to kind of form a little army in his um, wow. outside his castle to stop them from coming in uh, and sure enough, the, the fire brigade did the job and they had to go all the way back to Munich. And it was a bit later um, that they came with a few more heavies and they managed to take him and they took him to this lake, didn't they? Um, lake Starnberg, yeah. um, where he was kept. He was kept and then he was found floating dead in Lake Starnberg in 1886. And I read one account which said his doctor also was found dead floating in the lake. And that, yeah. to me, is sus. Because um, well. water was shallow. He was a pretty decent swimmer. Um, He's a surfer, you know, we know that much. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and there is a there is a secret society to this day, which um, wants, they're called the Gugelmänner, and um, they're quite mysterious. They wear hoods and black robes, and they um, they are, keep petitioning the Prime Minister of Bavaria to have a big bust of him carved into a mountainside. Really? But yeah. um, the doctor who was found dead alongside him apparently had been assaulted. So there is a suggestion, and I don't want to get into any more scurrilous suggestions like you, Andy, but I'm just going to put this out there. <laughs> that some people think that Ludwig killed himself and that he killed the doctor as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there's a suggestion of that. I don't know. Or the doctor the doctor ran after him, was trying to save him. I thought maybe they fought in the water and yeah. sort of accidental drowning. But there is this quite weird twist, which I will agree supports Andy's theory, <laughs> which is that a portrait of Ludwig has just been quite recently uncovered, discovered. And it was the portrait that was done a few hours after his death, that weird thing that they used to do. Wow. Back in the day. Yeah. Um, and there's blood coming from his mouth. <sighs> and the argument is that if you just drowned, then you wouldn't have blood falling That's from true. your mouth. I've got one more theory to chuck in about his death. Oh, yeah, mm. great. I think it's something that Andy hit on, uh, which no one else probably has touched on, that's busted this case wide open. Um, so the story I read is that he asked the doctor to go for a walk, and then they were later found dead by this lake. Now, could it be that Ludwig had noticed something extraordinary at this lake? Because... <laughs> 
Only just a this few. This is just such a true crime podcast. <laughs> well, you've got into. It's Only where the listeners are. We've got to follow. <laughs> <laughs> just a few short years later, what billion dollar industry erupts on the very shores of that lake? The wave machine industry. Yes. I, I think billion dollar is a <laughs> I think claim. Ludwig said to the doctor, listen, mate, I found the spot where we can make the next stage of my prototype wave machine. There was a third person in the party who's not been recorded. Uh, it's too much of a uh, coincidence. You mean Jonathan Wave Machine? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the whom the invention was named. That's something fishy. Wow. Going. That's a very entertaining and interesting theory. <laughs> It's definitely worth saying, I think. Wow, our journey into true crime has been very smooth so far. <laughs> yeah, I don't think my favourite murderers shit themselves much at all. <laughs> okay, it is time for fact number two, and that is my fact. My fact this week is that some dinner knives in the 16th century had sheet music etched onto the blade so that guests could sing a blessing together before... And after the meal. So this is a fact that I spotted on Twitter. Um, it's a guy called Filippo Lorenzen who um, tweeted about these knives, which which I just found astonishing. They're so beautiful. Wow. That's really how cool. big were dinner knives? I mean, I'll tell you well, what. How, how long was this piece of music? These were very so? much. These were very much crocodile Dundee size <laughs> knives, and there's a lot of um, confusion so about. They- Took them out and went, call that a knife. <laughs> <laughs> so if we were doing what the knives had said just then and we were following James, James would have had his little tune there. Mm. But on my knife, I would have had a separate set of notes that would harmonize with James, as would you, Andy, wow. and as with you, Anna. Having good we luck would... harmonizing with what I just did. <laughs> <laughs> and so it would be it would be a song that came out where everyone had a different part. So you weren't all singing the same notes. And so, yeah, a beautiful chorus would come out. Um, beautiful but- chorus. Oh, these guys are probably pissed at this stage. No one's a professional <laughs> singer. It, they probably can't even read the music. Yeah. And so what's interesting about these as well is there's only 16 of these that we have um, uh, that we know of that exist. And they're in different museums all over the world. The V&A has a really nice one um, and a great video of showing how the song could sound because they actually have one of their curators, Flora Dennis. Uh, she goes to a studio and has it sung out by proper oh. singers. So you can actually hear the song that's sung. Oh. And the the knives were a bit different. On one of them, one side, it would have the blessing before you start your meal. On the other side, it would be a thank you for the meal that you just ate. But they don't know how they use these knives because were they used as functional knives? You didn't really cut your own meat back then. Mm. That was something that your servants would do. There were people who had specific jobs for that. And also, it's a very flat knife. You could cut meat in theory, but it looked more like it was a serving knife. They were made somewhere in France in the 1550s, but they were made for an Italian client. We don't really know who that Italian client was. So there's a lot of confusion and mystery around it. But I'm sure Mm. true crime fish will get to the bottom of it (laughs) before this fact is over. There is one theory. Um, This was according to art historian Mimi Hellman. Um, She thought that it was a way of checking whether your guests were kind of au fait with musical notation. And so if they didn't really understand the musical notation, then maybe they weren't good enough to be in your society. So it's a way of weeding out the, the nouveau riche. Christ, but isn't it? But they've already been invited to dinner at that stage. It's quite late to um, to be weeding <laughs> yeah, them out. Do you yeah, send but you them know, home you've got the... <laughs> the Smiths have just moved in down the street, and you're like, oh, let's let's have them over to dinner and let's see if they yeah. can hold a tune. Yeah, I like that. That's really wow. So we we think it's a struggle remembering that you have to start from the outside and work your way in, but <laughs> <laughs> knowing musical notation and then being able to strike the right pitch. I know. Yeah. And laying the table difficult because if you miss one knife out, if you've lost a knife, or you, surely you need the, exactly the right number of guests, otherwise you're missing a crucial part of the melody. That's true. They used to be quite beautiful knives as well as musical. So your personal knives would have really nice ornate decorations if you had a bit of money. You'd have pictures of babies on them quite often, apparently. Really? Really? Um, as in your your own children or random babies? I think random babies, maybe cherubs, um, winged ah. babies, flowers, peasants, feathers, doves. <laughs> Peasant. Again, you know, you get... Lots. Oh, what a beautiful peasant. <laughs> a bucolic rustic scene. You've All got right. to drop a peasant in there next to a haystack or something. Okay. Again, these must have been huge knives. 
Um, this is according to B. Wilson, obviously the sort of queen of um, oh, crockery yeah. history. So good. And she said, you would no more use someone else's knife than you'd use someone else's toothbrush. Oh, uh, really? That's, right. that's how attached people were. Shall we quickly um, name check B. Wilson's book, Consider the Fork, which is one of the great nonfiction books over the last few years and yeah. And also, yeah. also features knives. Very misleading title. <laughs> yeah. It's so good. It's such a good book. Um, yeah. Hey, um, do you know um, in France, pointy knives were made illegal during the um, 1600s? Really? Um, do you know by who? Oh, uh, uh, in what year? 1669, I believe. In France. Let's say Louis the Louis the Fourteenth. It's old mate Louis the Fourteenth. Oh, yes, <laughs> he's oh. back. He's back. Um, yeah, no, because there was this whole thing where th- there was a, a very influential cardinal who um, has a very impressive surname that I've tried pronouncing about twelve times before this started. You guys all know him, Richelieu. 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 Cardinal Richelieu. Um, he was, you know what James was saying earlier about separating the nouveau riche from coming in if they mm. were trying to pretend uh, that they had singing or notation abilities. He had that with people bringing their own knives and they would come in and he noticed at one of the dinner tables that there was a guy who was sort of being really uncouth and picking his teeth with a knife. And he was like, you're not a rich guy. You're just faking being a rich guy. I can tell by your manners. And so wow. he banned all of the pointy knives coming to the dinner table. And that's sort of where we started getting the much more rounded wow. knife at the dinner the table. Knife. Yeah, Dan. the butter knife. Dan, did he call this guy Nouveau Richelieu? If not, I'm- why not? Well, because I can't pronounce A the name. <laughs> B, I almost, I almost just got away with Nouveau Riche. I didn't quite pronounce that properly. So the idea of even sandwiching those two together is a, I've lost sleep over. Fine. Wow, that's interesting because you would have assumed it was to stop the stabby stabby dinner party thing, wouldn't yeah. you? Yeah, but it's just bad manners. Just I think it was a, ch- it was a politician, wasn't it? It was Chancellor Seguier, apparently, who came round. And Dad, why did you not tell us it was him? <laughs> Uh, There's no one I can name in this entire anecdote, annoyingly, except uh, for Louis. Would, yeah. <laughs> but it was an, it was an interesting segue from uh, the previous oh Louis the Fourteenth. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be so great if that was where he got his name. He just always facilitated change in conversation. No, that, <laughs> that's, that guy. He always used to come to dinner parties on one of those, like, um, scooters. Of course, like she yeah. can't fall off. Yeah, they were horse drawn back then, of course. But it was <laughs> horse drawn segue. That would be amazing. Are you familiar with the stupendous, splendiferous butter up knife? Yep. <laughs> it sounds <laughs> functional. Yeah, you, it sounds like it was made by Roald Dahl, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. That's its long name. I think it goes by the shorthand, the butter up knife. I'm so excited about this knife. I'm actually going to order one. Okay. It's a knife that was invented by a Kickstarter in 2014. It raised 360,000 Australian dollars in Australia, 15,200 backers. For obvious reasons, what it has is it has like tiny little cheese grater type holes on one side. So when you run it along the butter, it splits the butter into little ribbons. Mm. And that means that if your butter's hard, it immediately softens it. Because the surface area, and then you can spread oh, it nicely. Okay, right. So it ends your trauma with <laughs> breaking your bread into pieces that you always have in winter when your butter's too solid to spread. I had a look into my favourite knife because um, oh, yeah. I realised I knew nothing about it, and it's a it's a knife that I grew up watching on TV. It's the Ginsu two thousand, the <laughs> the classic Ginsu knife. You guys know Ginsu, right? I've this never is heard of that. Maybe it wasn't as big here. There were huge. There were lots of infomercials. It was. It's a. Uh, it's quite a famous knife in America. Um, so I guess in Hong Kong we just must have had it. It was one of those ones where in adverts they would show it cutting through a shoe and they would show it cutting <laughs> through anything. This is the ultimate knife. Throw away the this rest of your knife. This is all so random. Done. Ginsu, I mean, no. When do you also... ever need to cut through a shoe? No one ever goes to a shoe shop and thinks, "Oh, this is a bit big. I'll cut the end off it." <laughs> I need. You need to throw away your shoes, James. But your kitchen bin is so tiny. <laughs> tiny bin. You have to. You have to do it. Take it apart. Uh, so okay, is, it, is so... it an amazing, like, like a Japanese steak knife kind of thing? Well, so this is what I thought. I thought Japanese technology um, it has sort of samurai uh, elements to the advertising that they did. Turns out that it was made in Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> and it was named 
by these copywriters called Barry Betcher and Ed Valenti and a guy called Arthur Schiff. And the idea was they were like, no one's going to buy it under its current name, which was Quick Cut. And they thought, okay, let's give it a Japanese name. Let's call it Ginsu. And they they turned it into a massive product immediately in America. It sold millions and millions. And it was it was one of those infomercials that coined the phrases. So it's the originator of, but wait, there's more. That phrase that we we all know. Wow. Brian, <laughs> Brian Butterfield uses it a lot. Um, <laughs> that is from that advert, as well as call now. Operators are on standby. Those were two lines that originated in these adverts. So the Ginsu was massive, but it's not Japanese at all. And it's not even a Japanese word. When the guy was asked, what does it mean? He says, it tr- roughly translates as, I never have to work again because it was so successful. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. To be honest, I think no one in the UK has heard of that. So just w- when you've done your, um, you know what it's like when you're attacked by a drunk Cleopatra. <laughs> <laughs> How have you but not some, heard of Ginsu? Some of our listeners, I'm sure, Dan, you've just absolutely blown yeah. their minds. But no, I've yeah. never heard of the Ginsu. Here's, yeah. here's, I was just trying to see if, as, as, if it was as popular oh. as I said it was. Uh, but I found another interesting fact just to lob in. So I was saying it cuts through shoes. It also is um, useful for cutting off penises because Lorena Bobbitt used a Ginsu knife on John Wayne Bobbitt's penis when she when she lobbed it off while he was sleeping in 1993. Did that feature in the adverts as well? <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure they wait, tried to. wait, there's more. You can <laughs> cut penises with it. <laughs> Dan, what a, just a thing to just lob in there. A Ginsu. Ginsu. They're world famous. Like, I can't believe they're not famous here. I am actually shocked. They're not famous. Might, I mean, it's possible that the three of us have just lived a sheltered life and never heard of a good sea. <laughs> yeah. What are the odds? I think this is a dead this is a dead thing. It's not. It was massive. <laughs> just just one more thing on someone who loved knives, a guy called John Cummings. And he features in the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine. And he proved, if you need it proving, that you should not swallow knives. And he did this because he was a sailor. And it's like late 18th century. And he'd seen a mountebank do the fake knife swallowing trick. And he said to all his sailor mates, mate, I can do that for real. And so he did. So he swallowed on the first uh, attempt, he swallowed 19 or 20 knives. Um, and he did have excessive pain in his stomach and intestines. He got oh. some medical help. He threw up a lot. He pooed out quite a few of them. What? Um, oh, Yep, knives were coming up and going down uh, all over the shop. So I guess everyone Whoa. was so impressed with him then that he tried it a few more times and every time he got drunk, apparently, on board, he'd say, there was this time I swallowed all these knives. If you don't believe me, I'll do it again. And I think he ate about 40 different knives and one clasp knife case as well. And he found it very unpleasant. He was in a lot of pain. He, again, vomited and pooed quite a few of them, but not enough uh, to save him. And he visited a London surgeon. So when he landed at Shaw, visited a London surgeon, and the surgeons just didn't believe him. He said, I, look, I think I've swallowed about three dozen knives. Can you perform surgery? And they said, oh, don't be stupid. No one would do that. And a case. He'd swallowed a class knife <laughs> case as well. What is the point of swallowing a knife case once you've already swallowed three dozen knives? No one's going to be extra impressed by that I bit. Know. If he could somehow <laughs> jiggle around his insides, he might be able to get the knives into the case. Oh, yes. Yeah. Maybe that was part of the trick he hadn't honed yet. It was the spider he was swallowing to catch the fly of the 36 <laughs> knives he'd already swallowed. <laughs> So uh, sadly, much like the old woman who swallowed the fly, he he died, of course. And then mm. they did open him up and they did find that he had about 30 to 40 fragments of wood, metal and horn inside him. So he was telling the truth. Wow. So don't swallow knives, kids. <laughs> <laughs> Just on party tricks with knives, I discovered that there's a knife throwing hall of fame. And it's a it's a sort of group in America that it's all the people that you see when they stand someone against a, a wooden door and just mm. chuck the knives yeah, at them. It's, yeah. it's, it's for that. So the list of people who are on the sort of greatest current knife throwers, there's a guy called Ted Eisenberg, who's the he's ranked 18th in the world at the moment for knife throwing. Um, he also holds a Guinness World Record for the most breast augmentation surgeries ever to be performed no, by a male. He doesn't do it by throwing the knife at the <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> yeah. patient. Doesn't if he? he's not combined the two, then he's missed a trick. He definitely should do that. Um, There's, there's Lorena called... Bobbitt who does penis reduction <laughs> surgery. <laughs> With a Ginsu or whatever it was. <laughs> Ginsu, yes. Yes, see, you do know it. Um, there's the great Throdini, uh, the world's fastest and most accurate knife thrower, he calls himself. 
Um, and then there's Jack Dagger, the King of Fling. And Jack Dagger supposedly has invented the first new knife throwing stunt in almost a hundred years. How? And it's called the cucumber slice. So he gets his assistant to stand up against the door and she puts her arm up horizontal and rests on it a full cucumber. And he throws a couple of knives. And then on this, in this video, the third knife, he throws it and he slices the cucumber in half that is resting on her arm. Wow. That's the trick. That's the first new what, innovation. In, like, in Lengthways horizontal. Yeah. That's yeah. incredible. Yeah. Very so cool. Jack Dagger, King of Fling, has, yeah, the oh. first in a hundred years. And of course, he um, keeps a jug of pims just beneath that uh, cucumber. <laughs> that's the real coup de grace. <laughs> Okay, it is time for fact number three, and that is Andy. My fact is that almost all drug names in America have been approved by just two women in Chicago. Mm. Amazing. Mm. They're called Stephanie and Gail, and <laughs> they... Um, <laughs> do they have surnames? Or... They do. Uh, They're Stephanie Schubert and Gail Carrot, but I just thought it sounded more mysterious if I just gave the first names. But they, well, they have Schubert, surnames, Schubert and they're... Carrot would have sounded way more mysterious. Oh, Schubert and Carrot. That. Let's get some true crime going. One yeah. of them's a musician, one of them's a vegetable. <laughs> <laughs> Together, they solve crimes. Stupid and carrot. Yeah. <laughs> it's an incredibly unlikely friendship. <laughs> um, so the, 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 the reason that they have the responsibility for approving uh, so many drug names is that they uh, work for the United States Adopted Names Programme. Um, so basically, there's a tiny bit of explaining to do here, which is that each drug... Uh, made has three names it's got the chemical name which is unbelievably complicated and long mm-hmm. it's got the generic name which is you know like what does. scientists would call it or something exactly yeah uh, and then there's a branded name which is what the pharmaceutical company that makes it you know that's your anisole or whatever that's a brand name i to... believe it's pronounced anisole <laughs> yeah is it heck it's, <laughs> it's so clearly no, anisole. The, the company like, says it's pronounced anisole it's such bullshit they does it actually lean into yeah. it. yes they do they do adverts <laughs> where it's anisole I'm like guys lean in um <laughs> is, anyway. this, is this the work of schubert and carrot <laughs> <laughs> i didn't mean to i didn't mean to start talking about anisole this early if anyone wants to know what anisole is then it's worth looking into if you've just swallowed 35 knives <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're going to need the big, the big cube, I think. Um, <laughs> okay, so basically, sorry, just complete distracted already. So, drug makers, um, you know, they give the drug a chemical name, but you need a single generic name, and that then goes to the World Health Organization. So, it has to be cleared because the generic names are usually global these days. It has the same generic name throughout the world to avoid confusion. And when a drug firm has a new drug they want to to give a generic name to, they write in to the USAN, which is pretty much just Stephanie and Gail. Um, sorry, Schubert and Carrot. Yeah, Carrot, please. <laughs> um, sorry, sorry, sorry. And um, they either approve the names if they're okay, but if it's too similar to an existing name or it's inappropriate in some language maybe, or if it's linguistically unfit, they're the ones who come up with the new generic name and write back to the firm saying, hey. So they're like, sorry, we've got one of those. Have you thought of butthole soul? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I think they wouldn't put, they wouldn't call it butthole soul because that would be the brand name. It would be more like, you know, uh, exactly. But you, but your soul. Well, so generic names are not James, allowed they, to They've got whole to... careers devoted to this. You can't on the spot just... <laughs> Okay, these guys are experts. I've realised that now, you know. I think yeah. that was a cocky attempt of you to make. It's classic, okay. classic mansplaining, isn't it? It's like, <laughs> oh, I could do this job easily. And then as soon as I try, no way. It's it's very hard. Because and it, just to say, neither anusol nor butthole soul, great name, would be accepted because the generic name can't refer to a body part. That's oh. one of the guidelines that they say because it's okay. a generic thing. So, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, and I, I actually wrote to to uh, Stephanie Schubert as part of this just to check the process works and she wrote back saying, yes, that's that's the process. <laughs> we didn't sound really like a the, great correspondence. <laughs> we didn't get the snappy band to go, but she, that's because she's a professional and she's got a lot of drugs to name. So. You, you're the next Michael Parkinson, Andy. You, yeah. I don't know how you get this stuff out of people. <laughs> So with the with the say like the current COVID vaccines, I guess that would be a process where they had to just fling it to the front and just go, we just need a name, right? We don't have time for all this stuff. 
Well, well that's that's brand yeah. names, right? So generic yeah. names of drugs are the names that when a patent expires, then it, you just get the generic version, like I- ibuprofen or whatever. Um, but at the moment, these are all, that's why they've all got lots of different names, these COVID vaccines. They're well, all uh, s- some of them don't, though. That's the bizarre thing. The Pfizer jab, which gets mm-hmm. referred to by literally 100% of people as the Pfizer jab, is mm-hmm. technically called Cormirinati. Do you have to do it in a West Country accent? <laughs> Cormirinati. Um, it's, it's a mix of community, immunity, mRNA and COVID, and it gets called Cormirinati. Um, but the AstraZeneca one, it has a, a brand name in India, which is Covishield, and everywhere else in the world it just gets called the AstraZeneca jab. Oh, really? Yeah. The thing is that there are lots of different people who can name it. So there's the um, British approved names. Um, So if there's any drug that's done in Britain, our version of Carrot and Schubert is the British approved names group. Uh, In France, they have the Domination Commune Française. In Japanese, they have Japanese adopted names. And all these people then feed it into the World Health Organization, who then make the final decisions. Um, But in the 90s, there was a problem because loads of names were different all around the world uh, before the WHO kind of got in on this. And there was a letter in the BMJ that gave 100 common drugs where the names was completely different in the UK than what it was in America. Just completely different. And if you look at like some of the older things like paracetamol, in English, it's paracetamol. In French, it's paracetamol. In Spanish, it's paracetamol. In Russian, it's paracetamol. And in um, the US, it's acetaminophen. It's just completely oh, oh. different, isn't right. it? What? I mean, that's just a. Comp- They've always got to be different, haven't they? Yeah. yeah. Just, um, but see, that would be a, that would be a, a name that we, they would Americans would be like, yeah, that's our name for it, yeah, right? Exactly. It's like yeah. Ginsu. See, oh this is God. what I'm trying to say. Uh, you I can knew. have you can have world famous yeah, things that we're. We're just oblivious to. I had and that's a good half, example. Half a second before he said it, I thought he's going to bring us back to the bloody knife. <laughs> Interestingly, if you do get your penis chopped off, then paracetamol is probably going to help a little bit. Oh Again, do swallow paracetamol, don't swallow knives. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, but this is why uh, Schubert, Schubert and Carrot are so uh, crucial, I guess, is that America produces so many of the generic drugs that need to be spread around the world. And then it must be so difficult because they have to make sure that they're not confusing in any language, right? So they it can't have sounds, offensive names in any language. Although the only one that I could find, the only example they gave of one they rejected because it was rude, was a prefix to a drug name that was suggested as Privy, P-R-I-V-I, which one of them said sounds like an outhouse, which oh, I thought yeah. was quite a weird and prudish name uh, uh, to give for a toilet. But classic Schubert, though, you know, <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's prim. <laughs> Carrot's the party girl, isn't she? <laughs> and one problem with naming of medical stuff mm. is that um, sometimes they have things that have funny names in medicine. So especially in genes, have you guys ever looked at lists of gene names? No. no. They are amazing. This is where doctors really come into their own. So Tin Man, for instance, is one gene, and that's a gene that's required for proper development of the heart. Okay. Um, for oh, yeah. The Spock, the Spock one gene, and if that's mutated, then is it Is that makes... your ears? Very good. Oh, oh wow. give us give us them as quizzes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. Here we go. Um, so Spock, in Zebrafish, it gives them pointy ears. Um, cheap Date gene. Ooh. Um, never orders a dessert. No. Makes you get drunk off one glass of alcohol. It metabolizes it in a weird... Absolutely bang on. Mutations right. cause susceptibility to alcohol. Um, okay, I will give you the Ken and Barbie genes. Two different genes. Uh, they remove the genitals. Very That's, good. That should be Mutation. the Lorena gene. <laughs> <laughs> is it really... Is that what it is? That's Mutations on those genes mean that you lack external genitals. Again, it's mostly studied in zebrafish. Okay, um, right. But then if you get ill, then it can be quite serious. And then you've got this quite funny name. So, for instance, I think there was a disease called Catch-22. And it was a very clever acronym, which stood for cardiac anomaly, T-cell deficit, clefting, and hypocalcemia for chromosome 22. Very good. It's something quite serious when you've got it. And the name Catch-22 sounds like there's it's a no-win situation. Sure. So. That's one of those things where enough people were diagnosed. They said, I don't really want a disease that's called the Catch-22 disease. <laughs> well, it's like, did you catch one disease? Catch one disease? I've caught 22. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the same bloke invented heroin and aspirin within the same two weeks. 
Really? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, what Felix it? Hoffman working Hoffman, at Bayer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hoffman. Are and they he... related to each other? It, like, uh, is it almost like you just add salt to one, or is it <laughs> completely different? He well, he was medicines? he was adding yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, he was similar. adding acetyl. He was acetylizing various different molecules. Now both both had kind of been um, created. Those chemicals had been created previously, but they hadn't been commercialized or made in a stable form. Um, was the Hoffman the one who took loads of heroin and then cycled home, or? Oh, I thought that was the LSD guy, oh, Timothy it? Leary. Uh, maybe it was. No, I, I think you're know. right. I think it I might think have it's been Hoffman. Hoffman. Yeah, I, but I thought Hoffman. I thought he'd taken LSD and cycled uh, home. Maybe, maybe I can't he. Really remember. Um, yeah, but I, I mean, is the thing is, we sort of think it's funny now that heroin was marketed as a cough medicine um, by Bayer, but the, it, actually, tuberculosis and pneumonia were such massive causes of death that. It was very useful to have a cough remedy. Like it was a really desperate need, and within a year you could get heroin pastels, which I didn't know. Mm. Yeah. Would yeah. they flavour them? Yeah. You know, it, it tastes nice if you add a raspberry flavour to it. I don't know. I don't know if they were flavoured. That's I don't a know good that. way of you could play Russian roulette with fruit pastels, couldn't you? Where one <laughs> yes. of them has got heroin. <laughs> yes. Wow, that is the progression of the game Gin or Water, which is one of my favourite games. I think heroin oh. fruit pastels is the next stage. What's the th- what's Gin or Water? Oh, oh, come you know, on, a, Andy. Come on. Come on, mate. Did you never, <laughs> never go to go first year? No, I don't know it. I've never played it. But, but it's, it's pretty what obvious it what it is. It's. Have you ever played Jinsu or Water Stew? <laughs> what, what one one glass is full of knives <laughs> you have to guess which one you've swallowed <laughs> you have to remain straight faced regardless of whether you swallow gin water or a dagger uh, oh so you so they look identical and you drink a glass yeah and, and then you have to uh other people have to guess which one you've downed and other people uh, have to, to guess. like right yeah. keep a straight face if you've just had the water sorry i was thinking that you have to drink it and you have to Guess. guess which one, which one you've had. <laughs> and the absolutely hammered going, oh, I am fantastic at this game. <laughs> okay, it is time for our final fact of the show, and that is James. Okay, my fact this week is that Israel manually removed all colour from foreign TV broadcasts until 1981 as they were worried that if they broadcast colour TV, everyone would rush out and buy new sets, which would crash the economy. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Isn't it? What a... What, Incredible. I mean, so many so many questions. So I can't understand how everyone buying a new TV set would crash the economy. Okay, so the idea was that the uh, colour TVs would have been made outside of Israel. And so it would be... It would kind of change the balance of their... Um, of the balance sheet, basically, meaning that more people were buying things from abroad rather than buying things from at home. Um, there was a few other reasons that they didn't have colour TV for quite a long time. Some people argued that it would cause social polarisation because some people would be able to afford colour TVs and some people wouldn't, and yeah. they didn't want to do that. Some people just thought it was quite unseemly to have lots of television in the, in the home. Um, but basically, they came up with this eraser device that whenever they got a movie in from a different country it would just suck all the color out of it and it would put it out as a black and white image but people could buy an anti-eraser device (laughs) which meant that you could put all the color back in and loads of people started buying these uh, and then they'd be able to get the foreign um, color pictures and eventually i think possibly because there was an election coming um the israeli government said hey we're gonna do color tv we're the last people in the world um pretty much Um, (laughs) but we're gonna do it and then in 81 they did that reminds me a little bit that um, sort of the rubbing out and rubbing back in technology of something I read, which was a cheap alternative to colour TV in the 60s. So have you guys heard of this? In America in the 1960s, um, you could get colour televisions, but if you couldn't afford them, which many people couldn't, you could for $1 buy a coloured transparent plastic screen that you stuck on top of your TV. <laughs> what? Wait a minute. Um, <laughs> but they, but I, I mean... Obviously, it wouldn't work, right? Because well, <laughs> the grass would be orange, the sky would be green. James, they're not stupid, all right? So oh, what they sorry. did is they had three colours on it. The top third was blue. Uh, the bottom third was green. And yeah. the middle third had a sort of reddish tint. That works okay. if all your TV shows are based on a beach. If you're watching Baywatch, <laughs> absolutely smashing it. <laughs> That's why it did so well. The bottom is green. 
for grass. It was green. green. So if you're watching Sorry. footage only of a wholesale tomato market, actually, <laughs> it's unbelievably effective. That's right. Absolutely. And that happened to be the only program that was on throughout the 1960s. <laughs> so it's fine. But people did say it did. And I saw some pictures and it does sort of make it a bit more exciting. Obviously, it didn't exactly match with the colours that it was supposed to. But at least it made your television a bit more colourful to look yeah. at. That's right. right. Isn't so that funny. a great... I can't believe that colour TV was invented so early. So John Logie right. Baird, who was the pi- great pioneer of TV, he demonstrated it in 1928 at his lab in London. He filmed a basket of strawberries and he invented more ways of doing it in the 30s and it just didn't get picked up on for ages. Yeah. Well, yeah. I guess it was Maybe just too was. expensive. I think it? it was also a slightly different technology that they used with Baird yeah. than they came up with eventually using. But one of the things that Baird did was he had a demonstration with a young girl who would put different coloured hats on. And this would show all the different colours. And this oh. um, this girl was called Noelle Gordon. Uh, and she later became the first woman to interview a British prime minister. And she was an actor on Crossroads who won the TV Times Award for Most Popular Actress on eight occasions. Whoa, but she began her wow. career just changing hats in front of John Logie Baird. What a, I mean, a colourful career. Exactly. Yeah. Well, she wore a lot of different hats over the course of her career. Very you could good. Say. Yeah. All yeah. these Very great good. points. Can, can you say who the prime minister was who she interviewed? Uh, Macmillan. Can you say? I like that. That maybe yeah. it was. Um, <laughs> sorry, that's secret. No, that, no she, she was <laughs> the first to interview. Sorry, it's one British of the. It's one of the prime ministers I can't pronounce. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you think it's so fitting that John Logie Baird uh, made the first demonstration of colour TV using strawberries? And we've mentioned before that before he went into inventing television, he started a jam factory. Did he? Yeah, and I, maybe okay. he had left a, He was in Trinidad and he set up a jam factory. And I think it didn't work out because insects kept infesting the jam. <laughs> and the reason he'd went anyway was to stop himself being such a sickly child so he could get off with the girl that he loved. But when he came back, she was married anyway. So the whole trip was a disaster. Wow. But I reckon he must have come back with loads of surplus strawberries. Do you think, yeah. Do you think maybe he, he was... maybe had some like ones which weren't ripe yet and he kept them at the bottom of the screen and then some <laughs> ripe ones in the middle and then some blueberries yeah. above them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wait, but this wait, is like I, insider trading then, which you're not really allowed to do on sort of British TV. Well, you know, there right? he is going, look, Corrupt. Colour TV, what he's really pushing is his strawberry business. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, that's Hang true. on, I have, I have another link. I have another link here, and we're about to blow this thing wide open. The True Fish Crime Podcast true crime fish. <laughs> back on the rails. Let's do it. The first Colour TV broadcast in the UK was in 1967. What was it? It was the Wimbledon Tennis Tournament. <gasps> what do people eat? Strawberries and cream. John wow. Logie, you naughty, naughty boy. John Logie <laughs> bastard. <laughs> we have, we've crumbled the very foundations. Do you, and <laughs> do you know what was the first advert in colour on ITV? No. Was it for a wave pool? No, it was for <laughs> peas. But okay. they're a type of food. <laughs> Bird's eye peas, know, I... yeah. You're sort of like the crap detective who's just bit smart <laughs> in one episode, I think, James. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is why um, Schubert, Carrot and Harkin, that's what we used to be called. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Oh, I really wow. like, so Wimbledon was the first that was shown on, I'm guessing that must have been BBC Two, right? Because that yeah. was Attenborough yeah. involved. So that was the first in BBC Two, and that was in 67. In 69, BBC One officially went colour uh, with a lot of experiments. And the first full colour programme that they ever showed was Petula Clark, who sang Downtown. If you don't know her, you might know that song. Downtown. Everything, da, da, da. It's a big song. Sorry, I didn't bring my knife to this recording. <laughs> I'll be able to sing along. Uh, I love those songs where you only know one lyric and it's the name of the song. Yeah. <laughs> But um, they broadcast it for their first day of colour at 12am on the 15th of November, because that's when the licence kicked in. And then they shut off the channel till 10am because (laughs) there was no TV to be had. Yeah. So you got sort of like, you had to stay up, watch the one thing and then, okay, going forward, we're now playing, not completely colour, but more and more. Do you know how Australia went colour? Dan, you might know this already, actually. I... Uh, well, I only know it through researching it because I was curious about that. So, yeah. It was mad. It was mad. It was halfway through an episode of a sketch show 
they introduced color to the screen. Wow. It really fa- yeah, it was called the Auntie Jack Show. And it was complete, like, really sort of wild, crazy, Python-esque stuff. It was in 1975. Yeah. And they said the color monster is going to take over the TV. Wow. And a corner of the screen starts turning to color and they're oh freaking God. out on the rest of the screen and one of them says oh no it's got me i'm completely in color now and um yeah it's slowly great. the whole screen it, it's it's on youtube wow. and it's barking mad but it's yeah. very cool it was a show that was really popular but it had finished so it was called the anti the anti jack uh, program and they brought auntie jack back who had been killed off in the final episode of the previous series so they sort of like they they brought her back to life and it is like that wizard of oz moment where it goes from black and white to to color and um one of the char- one of the actors is in it is a guy called gary mcdonald who became norman gunston one of the biggest satirists in australia he invented the sort of ali g mode of interviewing he would go to real life events as a character and interview and he later appeared in moulin rouge um in a scene doing absinthe where kylie minogue comes and i just wanted to add that to show you i can learn from this podcast and i now know how to pronounce <laughs> her surname i'm now trying to trace back the kind Ky- from kylie minogue to the original fact there were so many different <laughs> lily pads that you let from one to the other why don't you that? just say Love you know it. who's sometimes on tv kylie minogue <laughs> oh that would have been better yeah that's true well moulin rouge of course is that's red and in that there's the green absinthe fairy so oh. it makes sense that a guy who was interested in color tv would have been up for a role in the film Guys, That's we've true. got to stop trying to blow shit wide open just for the sake of it. Okay, that is it. That is all of our facts. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to get in contact with any of us about the things that we have said over the course of this podcast, we can be found on our Twitter accounts. I'm on at Schreiberland. Andy. At Andrew Hunter M. James. At Schubert Carrot and Harkin. (laughs) (laughs) At James Harkin. And Anna. You can email podcast.qi.com. Yep, or you can go to our group account, which is at no such thing, or you can go to our website, no such thing as a fish.com. All of our previous episodes are up there. We'll be publishing Andy's correspondence with Schubert. Very exciting <laughs> emails. Um, we're also <laughs> dribbling very slowly all of the 20 Speak for yourself. hours. <laughs> We're slowly dribbling all of the clips up from our 20-hour-long marathon that we did for Comic Relief featuring 35 different guests. If you've not seen them yet, head to the Quite Interesting channel on YouTube and check them out. They're really, really fun. And if you can still help with any kind of donation towards our cause, comicrelief.com slash fish. Please do. I say it's our cause. It's it's Richard Curtis's. Um, <laughs> but yes, we will be back again next week and we'll see you then. Goodbye. James, when you and Schubert and Carrot solved a case, <laughs> did one of you say, looks like we solved it? And then someone else would say, I think you mean we ain't a solved it. <laughs> <laughs> I solved it, and you solved it, and you solved it. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, that's a good one.